Hey everyone, welcome to Crank It Up Podcast, the YouTube home of bringing games. I'm Jim Price, designer of Arvudia Battle of Birthrights, and today I want to tell you about the Fighter Class. The Fighter Class is centered on dealing damage and defeating units, but being very intentional about it. They have both damage output and outright destruction, both of which contribute to defeating units, but are not the same thing. The Fighters are my 8th favorite class in a core set with 8 classes, but what exactly does that mean? I absolutely love them, but they are my 8th favorite because they are the class most likely to be played wrong, and as a designer, I sometimes wonder if I bear responsibility for that. Long story short, I don't, as the Fighters are an incredible class if you follow their game plan. Before I could talk about Fighter abilities, I have to talk about the nature of damage, which I'll try to keep short. Damage and the opportunity to defeat units is a very important part of this game. It's antagonistic, but it serves a purpose, as it means you always have the option of removing a problematic unit. If someone wants to try to throw down a recruit for presence for points, you can counter that. It's an option you have, and Arudia is a game of options, meant to feel like a tactics game where you have full control of your army. It's why there is an action point allowance system in the first place. But defeating units also slows the game down. It removes power that could otherwise be exploited and means that you aren't using your plays to advance your own cause. Constantly defeating units creates what I call a war of attrition, one the fighters are not equipped to win. They have no card draw and no traditional burst. They rely on executing their game plan. If you play them to kill everything, you will lose. In Arudia and comparable games, the impression is that destruction and antagonism slow the game. In the fighter context, this is actually not true. When you look at the average turn count with fighters, it is lower when they win and higher when they lose. You would think their game plan wants you to defeat units, which should make the game take longer. So why are they better when they have fewer turns? Is that an indication of a random shuffle, meaning they hit their ceiling? No, it means you are properly executing their game plan. So how does defeating units not make the game longer? Simple, by doing everything to make the defeat count, and it begins with Kaimel. Of all the core set leaders, Kaimel is the one most likely to never trigger, but that's an incredible waste, as he is insane. Kaimel directly combats the notion that destruction slows the game down by replacing all the power lost. In fact, Kaimel can result in a net gain because he does not get penalized by weakness. If you defeat a 3 power unit, you get 3 power back in strength. If you defeat a 3 power unit that would be 4 because of weakness, you get back 4 power in strength. This is to prevent an anti-synergy with their cards, but the effect is clear. I defeat your unit, take its power, and keep the game moving along by ensuring that the battlefield progresses towards a capture. You need a unit on its battlefield, but that's easy enough to do with all of their unit-based damage. Kaimel can trigger multiple times per turn, and at any point in the turn, which is paramount to the fighter strategy, because they can greatly swing battlefields during the ambush phase. My personal fighter records include swinging a battlefield when I was down by 19, as well as an opportunity where I captured three battlefields in a turn. So how exactly do they do it? Like Kaimel, we need to time the antagonism carefully in order to get the maximum payoff. The first big play is centered around two of the five fighter double features. Fatal Strike is a deceptively powerful ability. It destroys a rival unit with one remaining health. Good damage cards can deal more than one damage, so why is Fatal Strike good? because it destroys the unit outright. You can have a 10 power unit with 10 shields and one health, and that unit is gonna die, unless they are specifically protected from destruction. And while unavoidable damage would seem to have the same effect, it's possible to prevent unavoidable damage, just not yet. So both have their counters, but Fatal Strike has the advantage that it can happen as an ambush ability and on any battlefield. Yes, the destruction is not limited to the captured battlefield on ambush, so as long as someone is within range, you can trigger this ability. But why would you defeat someone else? It largely has to do with triggering the second double feature, Guerrilla Warfare. Guerrilla Warfare gives you a strength for defeating a unit, which does not scale with the unit's power, but triggers a critical movement opportunity. You can move onto the captured battlefield if Guerrilla Warfare is there. You can move off of it if Guerrilla Warfare is elsewhere, saving a key unit. This is how I set up a triple capture. I had Guerrilla Warfare stationed on battlefields two and three, one of which was a forest. The power of the moved unit triggered the objective, and I was able to kill the rival unit there for the solo victory, moving off again to trigger the third battlefield. Because the defeats are happening after a battlefield has been captured, the power of removal does not matter. In fact, 
Guerrilla Warfare accelerates the game by keeping power on the field and potentially setting up multiple captures. This makes the fighter payoff extremely satisfying, but sometimes you need a quick reset, and it's a given with the fighters that someone, at some point, is going to die. It's just the nature of their strategy. The fighters have a very effective one-two punch between brute and critical hit, which can deal three combined unavoidable damage to take out most units. This is unavoidable both literally and figuratively, as shields do not matter, and the cards are played in succession, so you cannot heal in between. To counter this, you need defensive abilities like extra healing or cloaking, but sometimes it's better to just accept that it's going to happen. They only have one critical hit, the best free and easy damage card in the entire extended game, and they have no card draw or recursion, so this is a case of losing the battle, but winning the war. This is even more appropriate when combined with Kaimul, because the Brute has extra health, specifically so that it can hold the strength given by Kaimul, otherwise someone could just spend their turn and kill the Brute. While a player has the option to do a quick reset, which I've done plenty of times, the fact that Critical Hit and Fatal Strike combo so well together often is a reason not to. If the rival army does not have any healing, then an early critical hit means you can sit on Fatal Strike for several turns, knowing that you have an unavoidable ambush trigger most likely. And based on what Fatal Strike and Guerrilla Warfare can do, critical hit is crucial in making sure that you reach your payoff, so it has uses both now and later. For the final play, I want to talk about our deliberate attempts to incentivize spreading damage around, as opposed to killing everything in sight. Even with Kaimul and Guerrilla Warfare, you are realistically looking at no more than 1-2 to two net power added from destruction. This means the fighters can move a power around, but not really add it, which is why they have Arena. Arena only grows when you damage an undamaged unit, which means you should be focused on trying to give everyone damage. And there are plenty of reasons to want to do this, as it makes Attila more effective. Bodica is the best at hitting undamaged units, allowing that damage to have meaning later while also building up a sizable amount of charges. Attila can be the payoff for that damage, but Attila also creates charges for Arena, which your rival also wants to avoid. Giving the fighters any form of burst power is really risky, because you are covering their major weakness. How do you avoid Attila and Bodica? By placing shields, which is tactic suppression, which means that the fighters are slowing you down to their level, because they lose to bursts. The fear of damage is an effective weapon, so spread it around and force your rival to play out of their element. With the fighters, what you draft against them is just as important as what they draft against you. Obviously, you'll see the more defensive cards like Cloak of Sharon and Aegis Shield, as well as Memento, since units will obviously die prematurely. But for fighters, the Bevian Glaive is an obvious target. Since their actions do not add power and are rarely terminal, the Glaive's flexibility is a no-brainer. One of the best counters to fighters is to outlast some of their key cards, so they love the Memento as well. I actually love the Cloak of Sharon with Kaimul, as you have to be careful not to cloak him when you want the power during your rival's capture phase. Another obvious candidate is Ashes of Ifrit, but again, be responsible. Don't try to take out everything in the battle phase. The Ashes of Ifrit is great for anti-cloaking and great for that one battlefield damage. Gladiator for one area damage, Ashes of Ifrit for another, and Attila is far more effective. But the sleeper treasury card for fighters is the Tears of Undyne. It gives them another option during your battle phase for adding power, but it also plays directly into their come-from-behind strategy. It works really well with Guerrilla Warfare and setting up double scores because the timing doesn't matter. You can target any allied unit, not just the captured battlefield, which is really flexible for fighters. With a strategy focused entirely on their rival, the fighters have a drastically different playstyle from the others, but can be incredibly effective when used properly. What do you think of the fighter class? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Let's shut it down.